luggage in unattended. Unattended luggage will be removed and destroyed. Compositions and projects focus on drone pop 
electroacoustics, sound sculptures, VD guitar, and grain sample synthesis. Pair of glasses. Just need another pair of glasses so I can see you. <laughs> well, here we are. It's wonderful to see so many young people. It's about, I used to teach uh, first year electromagnetism for my last years at the in Institute. Yes, I say I, I used to um, teach first year electromagnetism at the Nisboy Institute in my last years as a teacher. And um, there were people your age all over the place, also 150. Um, let me see whether I can get this started. I just have to. Okay. I just have to, yeah. There it is. Do you, do you have a pointer, a laser pointer? So it will be like this. Okay, <laughs> that's another pointer. Uh, yeah, that would be fine. Okay, yes, that's good. Uh. <laughs> okay, fine. Yes, quantum, quantum mechanics is weird. And, and I'm going to try to expose to you, I know that you are not mathematically familiar. There will be essentially no equations. At some point I just have to show one. If you understand it, fine. If you don't, forget it. Um, so, so don't worry about that. Listen, listen to my words instead. I'm not a historian of, of science, so um, I have a lot of respect for his, his, history of science, but uh, I do not uh, do it myself. I've only written one paper on the history of science. So, so um, but um, and I'm not a philosopher either. I do not do philosophy. I have difficulty seeing what philosophy has done to science. And uh, so, so I think it's best to keep them out. Um, OK. Now, if you, the year from 16, late 1600s until the end of the 1800s, that time was a fantastically fruitful time in, in science. You had, first of all, you had the theory of Newton, which gave us mechanics. Mechanics which has to do with everyday uh, things like when you drive a car, when you walk around. I mean, there's Newtonian mechanics involved in me just standing and moving here and so on. That was 1687, very early, and he invented the mathematics to go with it, actually. But that has often happened, that, that physics has invented mathematics that later on that magicians have taken up. Um, even in the later time here with, with uh, uh, string theories, uh, mathematics had been invented that, uh, that in inspired the mathematicians. About uh, not quite 100 years later, one, uh, Newton, Newtonian mechanics were generalized to, to um, continuum mechanics, which has to do with water and air and, 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 and elastic materials and so on. And this was generalization, which, which was very important. And, uh, and uh, by the way, it also described waves. Newtonian mechanics itself was particles, planets as particles. Newton could explain planetary motion that Kepler had observed. But here, uh, you could explain what waves were. Physi the waves you see in the ocean, for example, the waves by which I speak to you, that come to you, my voice, voice comes as waves of compression and expansion of the air in front of me. In 1865, um, and other wave theory was created, which we call electromagnetism. It was created by, let me just, I may understand quantum mechanics, but I'm not sure I understand this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no. Another, another, theor another great theory came to it, which was uh, Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism. He built on 
previous, and, and when I just put one name down, because I don't want to, I'm not a historian, I don't want to give all the little details. There are tremendous complexity in the history of science. So let me just say that was James Maxwell who came with the final theory of electromagnetism, in which, as an additional bonus, he suddenly discovered that, that, way, that electro, you could have electromagnetic waves. And, when he, and he could calculate their speed, and that agreed with the speed of light, which had been known since Reumer's time. So that was a fantastic discovery for him. Um, he, um, didn't, he lived very short, he became 47 years old, but, um, but he created something which, in this electromagnetic theory, the Maxwell's equations, they're called, which really has had in, 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 in incredible uh, importance for our understanding of physical theory. Um, when I was a student, your age, uh, Maxwell's equation was for electromagnetism, electromagnetism only. But since then, uh, Maxwell's methods have been generalized to, to the whole standard model that we today have of all particles, essentially all particles, particles in the world. So Maxwell had much greater importance now, has much greater importance now than he had when I studied electromagnetism in 1959. Another theory, I'm just lining up the theories, and you can read this also as what physics students must learn during their uh, two first years, except the last line here. They should uh, have all these courses, courses and all that. Thermodynamics has to do with heat and, and work, and how heat and work are exchangeable. They are energy, are forms of energy. It was Boltzmann, and that was, I, I, when I mention him, it's because he showed that you could derive thermodynamics as an, as, as an approximation when you had infinitely many particles in a system. And um, this was very important to, to the development of quantum mechanics, which or at least the first start of it. Then comes in 1905, uh, we are, we, uh, the, the, the Newtonian mechanics experiences a change. Einstein created and discovered that he could make a theory which had Newtonian mechanics in it, but was better. This was a particle theory. So we have here waves, waves, statistics, statistics, and then particles. And then he also came with another theory, a, a bigger theory of relativity in 1915, which is a beautiful, read the paper, it's very good. <laughs> it's still very good. Anyway, finally, in 1925, Schrodinger, and others, Heisenberg and Schrodinger is a question, I mean, there's always, a, a, you will hear some other names in a moment here, created quantum mechanics, and a few years later, the first quantum field theory was, was created. Now, these were all theoretical constructs, but when I, I mention only those that had been tested, verified, validated in all respects. These are not the political theory. Remember in politics when somebody says, oh, but this is just a theory, it means it's taken out of the blue air. It's, it's absolutely, there's no evidence that it should be right. So these theories in politics mean that it's they're just speculation. Here in science, in physics, theories, all the way down here, are highly verified. We know they work. Quantum field theory is the latest of that kind. Since then, string theories have developed. But string theories have not been verified. We don't have a single indication that string theories should be right. But nevertheless, thousands and thousands of young people write theses about string theory and have done it since 1985. <laughs> okay. And I, I realize I have uh, 45 minutes only, so I may skip some slides here uh, <laughs> once in a while. In the late, so we have now a fantastic, uh, a fantastic build, uh, building of theory in the 19th, the 19th century, especially in, in the last half of the 19th century, from 1850 to 1900. And uh, there was also discoveries which you could not explain. Um, here you see uh, Newton's experiment, where he took a prism and he could break up light into a spectrum of colors. And um, he thought himself that light was particles. But um, I'll, uh, it was later uh, abandoned again, and, and I'll uh, explain why it was. If Maxwell, for example, considered light to be waves. It had wave properties. So again, there's this fight between particles and waves. 
For example, these spectra could be used to identify uh, the elements, which uh, fundamental elements like hydrogen, helium, lithium, barium, whatever you could you could mention, you could identify them by some lines that you found here, some dark lines that came in this continuous spectrum. You find some dark lines, and these are important for quantum mechanics. But um, and and here, for example, you have two yellow lines, which I think are, are sodium. But this is from the sun, sunlight here. And here, there's if you just heated iron up, so it became, uh, it got colors. You know, you could you could find the spectrum of it. That is the how how uh, you would see all these colors, but you will see uh, lines with light in. And here with hydrogen, you had a very simple spectrum. That's the simplest spectrum. And all this happened during the 18. Uh, from 1840 up to 1850s. People also tried to find systematics in these. When you see such a pattern, let's look for systematics. What could it be? And um, there were several attempts, but one of them which was successful was that the wavelength of the light could be, could, of, of these, uh, these spectral lines, could be represented by a simple formula called Rydberg formula. Forget it if, if you don't understand it. But there were several series of such lines that were related to each other. And, and, and uh, it was used actually already in the 1800s to identify uh, materials. For example, you could identify there was, was um, helium in the sun, and, and the helium was identified. That's why it's called helium. Remember in Greek, helios is the sun. So it's uh, the helium that makes you sound like Donald Duck when you inhale it and speak. Um, you heard that, all of you. Anyway. Just to say that there was this development, and nobody knew where these spectral lines came from. You could make empirical formulas, but you could not actually explain them. Another thing that, that, that was happening in the late in 1800s was the cathode, uh, the, the cathode rays was di were discovered. You had sort of an evacuated tube here. If you put a tension between the cathode and the anode here, then you would see some light come out, and this light you could, if you had a little cross in here, I think it's, it's uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the um, Templar's cross, cross there, then that, that would be projected from here down to the ends. So something was coming out. One didn't know what it was for a long time, but under high tension, you could see something coming out and hitting the wall and creating colors. Finally, you could put a magnet, a magnet here, there's a magnet hanging here, and that could move the shadow. So again, that was interesting. So there were charged particles. Charged particles influence and bend their rays. That's what's used in the television of the old kind before the, the flat screens came around. You had televisions that were this big, you know, and computer screens that had so, so big back size. Today it's all gone. But that were electron, that was uh, um, cathode rays that were used for creating the picture on the, in a television. Another thing which I will just mention because it does have importance for the discovery of quantum mechanics was that Ernest Rutherford, he classified uh, radioactive materials and what came out of them. Something came out of them. In fact, from the cathode rays, one discovered already in 1897 that, that these were particles. And J.J. And, um, Thompson discovered that. And, and these particles were negatively charged. They had negative charge. And they were always the same charge and mass and so on. So they were real particles, not waves. Although it looks like this is a wave that comes through there. And there were all the other things coming out of matter. Alpha particles, which, which uh, Rutherford identified as helium ions in 1907. And beta, which already had been identified also to be the same electrons that Thomson found in the ray, uh, cathode rays. And gammas, which were later on in 1910, in fact, first identified as radiation, uh, 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 element, uh, I call it electromagnetic radiation. Now we come to the first point. So we, all these things happened before year 1900. In the year 1900, there was a youngish man, he was not yet young, um, Max Planck, who, he was interested, there was a general interest in discussion in the science circles of the spectrum of light. For example, the spectrum of light that comes from the sun, it is strongest around the yellow, and then it goes down here towards the smaller wavelengths, that's the ultraviolet, and, and the other side it goes down also and becomes infrared. So this is the wavelength. It's like 400 
nanometers, this four is 400 nanometers, and this is 700 nanometers. So it's, it's, it's a fairly small wavelength. And um, one had some explanation, in fact, Planck didn't know that explanation because it was made in 1900 by Rayleigh that for, for, for the long wavelengths, and there was another uh, explanation for the short wavelengths, which had been made by a guy called Wien, who came from Wien. And, uh, and, and, um, but one didn't know why it turned over. And, and, and Planck worked very hard. He used Boltzmann's method in thermodynamics to look at this radiation that comes from what he called a black body. A black body is a body which absorbs all radiation and emits it again, and it has a definite temperature. The black. So look into the oven and stick your face down to the oven when it's, it's heating, and you'll feel the blast of heat coming out there. That's heat radiation. It has a peak way down here. It's, much one, it's, it's not in the visible unless if you go to the visible, then your oven will ignite the kitchen. Because <laughs> this is 5,800 degrees, the peak of sunlight. This is the surface of the sun, which is 6,000 degrees about in temperature. And we see what we observe here is such a spectrum here. And this is the intensity, there's most of it in the yellow region. And green next, next to, that's probably why we like green so much. It's very effective, a lot of energy is coming in there. But Planck said he could not explain it. He tried several times in the year 1900, and he came with one talk after the other at the German Physical Society. But but uh, he, he, he began to get nearer. He, he generalized a little and so on, but he hadn't got a real explanation. Then, in the early 1900, 1901, he published an article in which he says, now I have found out a very strange thing. If I assume that light does not come as a sort of continuous wave, but comes in little particles with a definite energy, with specific energy, and that energy was connected to the frequency, which is the same, basically, as the color here. It's the, the, the reciprocal of the, of, the, um, of the wavelength. But he found that this equation, and remember, you all know the E equal to mc squared that Einstein made. That's, everybody knows that equation, right? And this is an equation of the same simplicity, in fact. There's a constant here called Planck constant, which is very small, but you can, so, so whenever you are hit by light, it comes in little lumps. In fact, light is particles. So now suddenly, we thought light was waves, that was what Maxwell had taught us. But light is also particles, apparently. Well, Planck didn't say that. He said it's because the atoms that emit the light, and in fact, one didn't know atoms, but the matter that emits this light uh, has limitations on its the packages come from, from, the, from the oven, so to speak. And not, it's not light itself. So that was the first thing. He didn't, he didn't draw that conclusion. I like this picture, that's roughly as he looked there. This is somewhat later, and the man uh, was very hard hit. He lost two sons in the First World War, and so on. So he had this very sad face. Uh, but uh, he, later, he, he lived until he became in the 90s. So he lived into 1940. In fact, I was born before he died. But <laughs> 1918, he got the Nobel Prize. That's all. The next step in, in developing the quantum was Einstein. Einstein was sitting in Bern in, in, in Switzerland, and he had a wife who was a physicist, didn't know that he was married to the world's best physicists, and uh, she competed with him, she was also a physicist. And they had a child, and they had a small apartment. I've actually been in that house, there's a cafe underneath, and the physicist, from, I gave a talk in Bern, and they took me over there so I could see sort of where Einstein had lived. But um, he was sitting there, he was a charming man, as every girl can see here, and, um, <laughs> and uh, he, he wrote, in the spring of 1905, he wrote three articles, maybe even four, which each of them could have brought him the Nobel Prize. Relativity was one of them. It didn't give him the Nobel Prize for relativity. This, called the photoelectric effect, uh, gave him the Nobel Prize. The, but what is it then? Well, it was known that if you radiated ultraviolet light on metals, for example, you had electrons coming out. You could observe that because they're charged, they're easy to observe. And um, the interesting thing was that, that, and that there were some ideas that, that, that if you increase the intensity of the light, 
it wouldn't change the speed with which electrons came out, but if you change the color of the light, it would. And Einstein took that, he took Planck's idea seriously and said, well, if you send light of a given, cover, a given color, new is the color, if you send that into the uh, metal, then you have to pay a certain price for pulling out the electrons. It hits an electron. Is, the, is all of this <coughs> Planck quantum here is put onto an electron somewhere in an atom inside? Well, they, need, they couldn't talk about atoms somewhere inside the material. So it delivered all its energy, one go, like a particle. And then, of course, you had to pay a little to get it out. And that you had the formula for what? What you saw when you observed uh, electrons, they had that energy there, which is the Planck energy minus a certain what's called work function. Doesn't matter. Anyway, the equations are not difficult here. Uh, this is sort of, I hope, this is uh, yeah, this is high school level. Um, so, but what he realized was that the light quantum was indivisible. He thought the light quantum was a property of light and not just a property of the oven that emits the light or the sun that emits the light. It's really a property of light itself that it comes in package. And these packages can hit something. And like a particle, they can deliver all their energy to this something they hit. And um, so this was the first time where the photon, the, uh, the, yeah, what light was considered to consist of particles, just like Newton thought, but in other kind of particles, because light is also waves. It's very easy to prove. It took some time before this equation here was probably uh, Millikan confirmed in 1914. And later, <coughs> in, in, in uh, 1924, it was shown that the light quanta, just like particles, carry momentum. Momentum is what every polit politician talks about now, but it's really mass times velocity. So uh, think of it as velocity. So, so every light particle carries a momentum which, which, which uh, can hit, so you can make collisions just like uh, with, between particles where a particle come in, hits another, and sends it off in a, in, a, in a different direction. He got the Nobel Prize in 1921, but it wasn't paid out before 1922, where Bohr got his. Finally now, we are still in the preparation. This is the first phase of quantum physics which really is quite, it, start, it comes in little fits and starts. Nobody believes it except for a few like Einstein. And, uh, and uh, but Rutherford, he was an experimentalist. He was a gifted experimentalist. And he had been involved already with a lot of, lot of um, experiments, with, among others, with, with identifying alpha particles and beta particles and so on. But in 1910 or 11, he published in 11, in 1910 he asked his co-workers Geiger and Marston, he asked them to look for backscattering. They were sending alpha particles into a gold foil. Gold foils are thin. They are sub-millimeter thin, tenth of a millimeter or something. But there are still a million or oh, 100,000, uh, 100,000, um, uh, at least 100,000 atoms in a row in there when you shoot into the gold foil. So there's lots to collide with. And mostly such alpha particles would just get a little deviation. They hit some electron and they would deviate it a little. But sometimes he thought, he, he got the idea, let us look at large angles where it's scattered backwards or at least to the side, but coming back towards me. Now, people thought at that time they didn't know what matter was. And it's like they were shooting, shooting alpha particles into a gold foil was like shooting rifle bullets into a haystack. Usually, it'll just go partly through and stop, and, and if, strong enough, the, uh, if the shot is strong enough, it'll go through and come out on the other side. But if you, sometimes, if you suddenly get one back in the face, what is your conclusion? There must be a stone in there. And exactly the same thing uh, uh, was what Mr. Rutherford did. He, this is his own drawing here. He, he, he made a theory here of what happens if there really are some point-like, very heavy stuff inside matter. For, he didn't call it nucleus, we do that today. Then you essentially, because this is electromagnetic interaction, this is basically the same as gravitational interaction, so it's basically a cometary 
orbit that you have there. Uh, comets never go in hyperbolas. This is a hyperbola, but they never, you never see them. You see them mostly in, para in parabolas and very long elongated ellipses. Comets coming into the solar system. But it was a, he could calculate the probability and he, the experiment done by these, by this Geiger, this is the Geiger with the Geiger counter, by the way, that, that um, uh, these part, these par he could really uh, get agreement with his theory and the observations of the backscatter angles. So we now know there's something in there. It is, just to tell you, it is small. It is actually 100,000 times smaller than the atom itself. The atom is not yet discovered, but now we come to it. 1913, Niels Bohr, who had done, he was a young man, 27 years old, he has just finished his thesis and so on, and he applied for a scholarship to go to England. And, um, and he, that was in 1910, he's applied, and he got a, a year to go to England. And he wanted to go to Cambridge, where J.J. Thomson was. Thomson was the one who identified the electron. And Thomson had ideas about what was inside matter. He didn't know at that time. It's very strange, there were no atoms. I mean, chemists claimed that there were atoms because they looked at simple chemical reactions which could best be explained by atoms and molecules. But you hadn't seen them, you hadn't observed them, you hadn't, so they didn't really know what matter consisted of. Uh, Thompson had some wrong idea. <laughs> and Bohr came to him, and Bohr's English was very poor, in fact. And, uh, so, and then he had just read a book that Thompson had written and, and the first time he meets Thompson, he has this book under his arm. He goes in there, and Thompson's the big famous scientist there, and opens the book and says, that is wrong. <laughs> that was not the beginning of a good friendship, in fact. <laughs> After a fairly short time, Bohr uh, became friends with Rutherford, who worked in Manchester, and went to Manchester. And there he was in the right environment. And there he, of course, were near these, uh, the discovery, or there was something, and he said, that's... That's a positive charge. Rutherford couldn't determine whether it was a positive or negative charge that was causing the backscatter. But he said, okay, we have a very, very, very fine, very compact nucleus, and then we have electrons circulating it around it. Now, that was when the atomic model starts. But the problem with the atomic model is that when you have something that circulates, well, then it emits electromagnetic radiation. And in fact, all your mobile phones when you communicate with nearby, nearby uh, masts, you do it by electromagnetic radiation, you do it by accelerating electrons up and down in the antenna, which sits inside the phone now, which used to be outside, remember? When you were little, <laughs> phones, phones had, um, had antennas outside. So he, so, so he knew very well that if you have a circulating electron and you can calculate very quickly, it will simply spiral around nucleus and come closer and closer, and in a very short time, it disappears into the nucleus. So what, and that, that of course, would stop most people in that track and say, well, we know that about electromagnetism, there's nothing to do there, we can't help it, it's, that's the way the world is. So atoms are wrong, they would conclude. However, this was not what Bohr did. He said, well, well, it can be, what if there are stationary states, states that don't radiate? There are discrete states that don't radiate. Well, how can that be? Well, I don't know, but that's how it is, he said. <laughs> and then he said, each state has a certain energy, and you can just number them, one, two, three. He had a model here. That's his own model. That's his own drawing. Here's the innermost ring. Here's another ring, two, then ring three, then ring four. So that there were some energies. For each of them, each of these stationary states, there was some energy, and it did not radiate. Actually, when you're sitting in any of these states here, out here, it's only in the ground state, inner state, that you never radiate. Here you can suddenly radiate and fall down. And he said, when it radiates, when it, it radiates a photon and moves from one to the other orbit, then the difference in energy is precisely what the, so it, it, it emits the, fo the electromagnetic radiation as a photon, as a quantum of a, a size h times nu. So he said the difference between the energies it goes from n to m is that is the energy of the, the, uh, the uh, energy of the photon determines the photon's color. Now you can see now now it begins to be interesting with spectra, which we didn't know the spectra, the spectral line, the, li the light emitting spectral lines. We didn't know them, 
But now he was in, in able to, in a short calculation, which really is high school calculation, should be done in every high school, but isn't, um, <laughs> that he calculated that the energies were a lot of numbers here, which I don't, these are natural constants that are known, Planck's constant here and so on, and, and then it goes like the n number, so it goes down. Uh, well, I don't have, yeah, I have it here again. One, two, four, nine. That's how it goes, this n squared there. So this is how the energies go down when you go up here. Energies are negative because the system is bound, the electron is bound, it can't get out. And there he was able to calculate Rydberg constant, which was, as I explained earlier, the, the, um, the, um, the, the empirical model that had been made for the hydrogen spectrum. And that was a great success. He really calculated to better precision than in, in the exper experimentalists had done. Now, this was how Bohr envisited in 1913. This was Thomas's collaborators. That this was radium, which in 1921, where they had drawn all the, uh, what is it, uh, how many, uh, I've forgotten how, what atomic number it has, but it's like close to 90 uh, uh, orbits here, electrons orbiting radium <coughs> atom. So here he began, in the years after, in already uh, he wrote three articles. In fact, he had just, on the 10th of April, I believe, at least in early April, got accepted the article for Philosophical Magazine in England. He was in the meantime gone back to Copenhagen because he had to get married. Uh, not for the reason you think, but, but, but he, had, he was engaged to a very good girl, and Margrethe, and uh, he married her in August 1912. But in 1913, he was in Copenhagen as an assistant, and, and, um, and, uh, and he, uh, he, 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 did, he um, wrote three articles. The first one is the one you should read. The two next ones are based not based on the correct theory, although he managed to do a lot with it. Okay, among other things, what he did in the years after the first discovery was, uh, in fact, already in, in 1913, he began, to, he began to explain the periodic table. You've all had chemistry, I'm sure, and you know that the elements, that's the, the fundamental elements of matter, that hydrogen, you see it here, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, uh, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium, and so on. They come in periodic thing. These all look like each other, behave like each other. These all columns all behave like each other. And these rows are shifts that uh, are also periodic. So there's periodicity. There's uh, noble gases sitting out here. But anyway, he could basically explain with simple ideas of how many electrons that could be in orbit in a given uh, uh, in a given distance from the atom, from the atom nucle atomic nucleus. So this was a very big uh, triumph for him. One of the triumphs that he had was that there was a hole here in the chemist's uh, periodic system. And he could predict the properties. He said, oh, this must be just like zirconium, which is sitting there. So he predicted that there would be there, and it was found when he was giving his Nobel Prize lecture in 1922. He was called up by Copenhagen by Hevesy, who said, we've got it. And it was called hafnium from, for being discovered in Copenhagen, which is called hafen, yeah, hafnium. So anyway, yes. So, but otherwise, there was now a period of almost 10 years where they tried to make a more systematic theory out of Bohr's discovery. Bohr became instantly famous. And, and because he's really done his homework and written down an article which explained things so that you could actually calculate this thing and it agreed, suddenly the spectra were understood. Although mostly hydrogen spectra, the higher order spectra were more difficult. But something like, like these metals here, they look like hydrogen. So you could also explain what's called the alkali metals by that. <coughs> anyway, so this was a story. Quantum mechanics had begun, but they hadn't got the theory. And they tried in the years, and Einstein moved in also and came with some important contribution, but you did not get a complete description like you would like, as a complete description as we have, for example, for Newtonian mechanics, which is valid for all non-relativistic systems, discrete systems, no, point-like systems, and also, of course, continuum systems. Then, 
and they worked hard. They worked, uh, and they published a lot of things, a lot of, and he, he became a professor, and he applied for money to build an institute, the Niels Bohr Institute, Bleidamsvai, and he got the money, he got the, the, the town of Copenhagen to give him the, he had his way with, with being given money. He was, he was himself out of, Bohr was himself out of uh, an intellectual family, fairly high-ranking, fine family. His father was a professor of physiology, if I'm not much mistaken. So, I mean, he, he, he had the education, the, the behavior that did went, went well down with people who had money and who, who contributed here, and, and pub officials, public officials, and so on. So, altogether, uh, a boar managed to get money for building an institute, and he moved into it himself. Found an there's an apartment, there was an apartment on top of the building. And, and uh, this is the institute which is still standing and which where I have spent about 55 years with interruptions where I've been outside Denmark. Anyway, so this is a story. He had his institute there and he began to collect, collect young, bright people. <coughs> they were 22. Pauli, Heisenberg, 22, born. They were all very young people. And there was an old, older guy called Schrodinger, but, um, but uh, but uh, there was this young crowd assembling around Bohr because Bohr had produced so much physics, even if it was not finished. And then they finished it, very simply. It started in 24 with Du Bois, Prince Du Bois. He's a, 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 he's a, a prince uh, and, and a nobleman, and he didn't have to work, but he did. And he was writing his thesis. And at that point, you see, he knows that Compton whom I had mentioned before, has shown that photons carry momentum and that you can calculate the wavelength of a photon as Planck's constant divided by the momentum, which is, remember, momentum is mass times velocity. And then he said, he sat and played, out, played around with Bohr's model and said, well, of course, if there's a wave with wavelength length associated with a photon, and a photon is also a particle according to Einstein, then maybe also an electron has a wave associated with it. It is a particle, yes, everybody can see it, just makes a spot when it hits something. Um, but, but he says, maybe the, 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 the electron also has a wave associated with it. And, and then he said, well, but this wave has to go around the orbit, the electron orbit, and it can be, this is four, four, four times here, and this is a number here, larger. But they had to, the wave had to meet up with itself correctly, and this meant that not all radii was possible. They had the radius here, so the circumference here had to be a com an inch to multiple, multiple, an inch to multiple of these wavelengths. And so he could explain the the hydrogen, the, the atom, the hydrogen structure and the, the and the structure in in in, in circulate or, circulating electron orbits. He could explain that by saying that the circumference must, must match, and these, these are the only allowed. If they don't meet correctly, they'll wash it out, watch themselves out. So if you try to make an orbit that is not the, the right point, where Bohr had said it should be, then it would. So he could explain Bohr's. So suddenly they got a new concept that maybe there was a wave associated with, with electrons also. And quite a short time after, there was some experimental indica indication that electrons did, in fact, uh, what's called diffract, like waves can make diffraction patterns, and um, I shall come back to it in a moment. And um, so quantum mechanics was born by these young people. Heisenberg was the first to come with his matrix model, then came Schrödinger with his Schrödinger's equation here, and then Dirac, short time after, showed that, that, uh, that, um, that they were equivalent, mathematically they were equivalent. But this begins to come, become higher mathematics now. Uh, this is, uh, especially Heisenberg's was a bit <coughs> difficult to understand for people. Anyway, the central thing here was that there was what's called a wave function, which was associated with any particle. You also had a wave function. And that wave function, what did it mean? Well, they thought the particle could be divided up and be several places at one time, but no, Max Born quickly, the same year, said the square of the wave function is probability. So you can now, be, you can now when you solve this, when you have a wave function, you can calculate 
and which is a function, for example, of the position of an electron, then you can calculate the probability that if you observe the electron, you'll find it at that position. So this was what the wave function was. This is what quantum mechanics is. But so how come you have particles? There was all this discussion of is it particle or wave, you, as I started by saying that, that, that continuum mechanics had waves in it, uh, electromagnetism, had wa electromagnetism had waves, and now it turns out that real matter particles like electrons, which really have a weight, in fact, they don't weigh so much, but uh, they have a weight that they should also have waves with them. Now, this is where the weirdness starts, and I'll, I'll make it sharper in a moment. Uh, by the way, the electrons, what I see when I see you is all electrons. I cannot see your nuclei. So all what you are, and when you kiss each other, it is electronic, <laughs> electromagnetic interactions. That's all it is. The nucleus is what you see when you weigh yourself. But if you took all the nuclei and put together, they would not, in, in your body, and they would not be bigger than a bacterium. It's very small if you pack them. Tight. The electrons weigh about, for in my case, about 20, between 20 and 30 grams. That's what you see. The visible part of me is just 20 or 30 grams. Anyway, and then there was also, and I cannot go so deeply into it, Heisenberg, who had been a little earlier in Schrodinger, but Schrodinger is sort of the most intuitively uh, the knee easiest way of understanding the wave theory. Uh, he had also that if you have if you have a particle and measures its position with a certain precision, you may also measure its momentum. Newton's laws require both position and momentum to to characterize a particle, and there will be a certain uncertainty there. With that then the product of the uncertainties has to be bigger than Planck's constant. It's, it's slightly modified Planck's constant, but it doesn't matter. But this was, was the result. And this means you cannot know position and momentum with exact precision anymore. That was the prerequisite for Newtonian physics. Now, Newtonian physics was deterministic. means if you know the world now, you can calculate it tomorrow, what it'll be tomorrow. And that, of course, works for planets. We all know that people can calculate where the comets that threaten or the, the uh, asteroids that threaten Earth, where they'll be in 100 or 200 years, no problem. So it's very deterministic. While we don't experience our daily work, uh, our daily life is deterministic. That's not how it is. It's because we do not know everything about the things we interact with. We, we breathe air, but I don't know where the mo molecules of the air really are there. They move 500 meters per second, by the way, so I'm sure you know it now. It's, it's, uh, and they run around and run, run into each other and so on. I don't know precisely where they are with watch velocity. So, so we are in a situation where the world can be contingent. It can be uh, it's statistical character. But underneath it, in, in that primitive understanding, in the classical physical understanding, we could, in principle, know all the positions and all the velocities of all the particles in the air, and we would predict everything about air for all the future. Now, Schrodinger equation is also a deterministic equation. So it tells you that if you know the wave today, you know it tomorrow. But the wave is a probability amplitude. You square it, and you get the probability. It's not a physical wave. But it is how you describe the electron. And, but where does indeterminacy then come? It comes from Heisenberg's uh, indeterminacy relations. That when you do a measurement, you cannot predict what you get. And I'll, I'll emphasize that now. And there, there sort of, the, 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 you cannot reverse a measurement. You cannot undo measurements. If you measured where an electron is, it has that position afterwards. You cannot undo it. You cannot go backwards. In, in, in deterministic equations, you can go back and forth. So I've actually seen these people in real life, some of them. And I talked to Dirac once when I was a young student. Now, let's now try to look. I think, I, what do I have, 10 minutes more or something like that? Can I, 10, 15 minutes, would that be all right? Okay, you want me to go on, you're listening. Okay, good. Now, if you have a water wave, you can do this on the beach, where the waves come in 
and there are small capillary waves and there are bigger gravitational waves. But the waves come in like sort of wave, waves in one in a sequence. You see the waves come rolling in with more or less fixed distance between them. If you then put in a blockage, you put in some wood, a board here and there, and you make an opening and you put in some wood there. So that there is two channels that the wave, the water can run through here. It's, re it's, rever it's, it's uh, thrown backwards here. Then what will happen? Well, there will be little circular waves here and there. And they will spread like half circles here. And then it turns out that these waves will amplify each other here and, 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 uh, and, in, and, and uh, destroy, uh, interfere destructively here. So that if you look at the, 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 the height of the waves over here when it hits, you see there are places where it's basically zero and places where it's high. So you see such a peak. peak. It's, called, uh, it's called an interference pattern. The wave, the two waves coming in here interfere. The, the one wave becomes two little waves that continue and interfere with each other, and there is an interference pattern when you measure it here. That is how waves work. So, and these people were, well, I mean, Bohr was, Bohr was not involved in the actual publishing there in 1925, 26, but he was there all the time, and he was very tough with these young guys. Heisenberg actually cried at some point because he kept <laughs> criticizing him, and Schrodinger, Schrodinger had a flu, and he was lying there being very sick, you know, and Bohr was walking up and down and arguing Schrodinger equation with him. And, and uh, he said in the end, I wish I never had invented that equation. <laughs> now, now we have an electron is described, the way we describe it, the way we observe it, it appears as a particle. You get a spot on a photographic emulsion if you hit it with an electron. This spot you can, may have to amplify a little by, by developing the photographic emulsion, but you get a spot. These are particles. Electrons are particles. It carries one definite charge and one definite mass, and it has momentum and energy as particles do. No problem there. But now, so if you look at the real particle, this is called Born's machine gun. I don't know where I have this picture from. I, I found it in my, in my stuff. Anyway, <laughs> when, you, when you shoot a lot of machine guns here, and machine guns, they, they sort of shake around, so they, they can actually spread bullets in a fairly wide region here. Some go, if there's, and you have two slits here, you close one slit, and you send electrons in here, they'll ma make a pattern here that you can see here. If you close the other slit, you will make a pattern like this. And if you open both slits, you get a double pattern, like this. Basically, it's the sum of these two patterns. You don't have interference here. But if you take waves in coming in here, you have a little paddle wheel here and send waves in, you know, like I described before. But if one uh, slit is closed, one opening is closed, you get a pattern like this, and that will basically look like this pattern. If the other is, is closed, if, if this one is closed and that is open, you get a pattern like this. But if they both open, you get an interference pattern. Now this is weird. What is an electron? A wave? A particle? It is what you decide to measure with it. You can make experiments in which you can verify the particle nature, and you can make experiments in which you can verify the, the wave uh, nature of the electrons. And so, so um, and this is also true. Here's for the electron, which is like machine gun, gun bullets, and here you see it has these two properties, and then it interferes. This is weird. It is not understandable. Well, here is Bohr's own drawing. He wanted to be sure that things were placed, so he put in uh, screws and so on to keep the things down. You send an electron in here, and because it's a very narrow thing, it diffracts a bit, it comes, uh, the whole, it covers the whole region here, so you get some going through here and some there, and you can close this one. And on the back side, you find an interference pattern like this here. If they're both open, if you close one, you don't see the interference pattern. Now, you say, th that led to discussions, of course. And um, for example, Einstein and Bohr in 1927 at the Solvay conferences argued hard, well, you could find it in the literature, I cannot go into this now, but they argued hard about whether one could sort of, what it, what it meant. Could you, for example, put a little measuring instrument in here that'll tell you which way the electron went? But as soon as you know that which way, and Bohr showed that explicitly by calculation, 
if you know which way the electron went, it went through there or through there, you can decide that, we can decide that, then the interference pattern disappears. Then you have made a particle measurement, and so it's a particle. But here, when you have both open, you have the interference of the Schrödinger waves here that make this pattern. Very strange. You say, okay, it's because electrons crowd each other. It's because there are so many electrons there, and, and at that time they could, they could certainly not. Uh, in fact, it took quite many years before this experiment was made directly. But, 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 uh, but Bohr said, no, that's not the way. It is there if you only send one electron at a time in. And that was 1989. Here we have an experiment of this kind by Tonomura. And uh, that's been made many times. But this is, let me show this. If you send in through a, 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 a few electrons, they make marks like this, as you can see there, scattered. You can see nothing there. You can also send four. Here's 200. You still cannot see anything. Uh, you may, if you know, you may know there's a little like a channel here and there, but it's not really there. But the 6,000, you begin to have a we, you begin to see now there could be some interference pattern. <laughs> and with 40,000, it's a bit stronger. And, and finally, with 140,000, it becomes clear there is an interference pattern. And there's only one electron in the apparatus at a time. So this must be a property of the electron. In the right experiment, it shows interference. This is completely, completely baffling. This, is, this you cannot understand. Of course, they speculated. You can speculate as much, but you cannot understand it. We have no experience that covers such behavior in our daily life. And all we understand is really what goes on in our daily life and what looks uh, many microscopic like bacteria and so on, they are still macroscopic. Although they're microscopic, they're still so macroscopic that you don't see phen phenomena like that. But actually, you probably could see interference phenomena for bacteria. But, uh, but, um, but anyway, so not only that, you could, if you wish, you could, you could make one electron go through, note where it, did, where it hit on the backside. You just make a little spot somewhere like there. Then you destroy your apparatus, but you write a little thesis taking how to build such an apparatus. You send, you put it in a time capsule and let a man open it a thousand years later. And he makes the apparatus according to your prescription. He sends one electron through and notes where it hits. And so you do for 40 million years, 140 million years, if there's a thousand. You do that every thousand year, throw the apparatus away, and you still see the interference pattern. Weird, isn't it? And, 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 and since then, uh, there's been lots of, uh, of uh, experiments with these uh, buckyballs, you know, these big, uh, s almost spherical molecules of 60 carbon atoms also show interference effects. I think I'll, uh, because I'm late, I think I'll just go around that, which basically illustrates the same uh, very strange behavior. If somebody wants, I can show it afterwards. Um, another thing, which another, and this is the second, the last iconic uh, 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 experiment which shows weirdness. I will tell about. Um, if you have two children, Alice and Bob, who has to visit mom and dad who lives in different parts that, of the world that moms and dads sometimes do, and they are with the aunt who says, "I have to send one for Christmas in one place and another." So the other and who they haven't she hadn't got any instructions, so she flips a coin and sends Alice to the left and Bob to the right, but it could easily have been the other way around, with 50% chance. Now it's very clear that when Dad sees Bob uh, step out of the airplane, he knows that Mom will see Alice. It was decided already here that he took an airplane, say, to Moscow, and she took an airplane to New York. So there's no problem there. We know that, that this is how it was. This is a classical. Um, and, and now you could be that when, as soon as he sees Bob come out, then Alice is there. Is there. But there's no, uh, there's no communication between them. If they arrive simultaneously, you cannot, he cannot say, ha ha, I got Bob. Uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> she won't receive it because she sees Alice before uh, the light signal can get out there. Let's now look at the quantum entanglement here. In this case, we have another kind of uh, putting together. We have a superposition of two possible waves. This is just like in the two-slit experiments. 
superposition of two waves, Alice going to the left and Bob to the right, or Bob going to the left and Alice to the right. But this is a quantum superposition, which means <laughs> it is one thing. It's a unique, it's a quantum, uh, it's a quantum state uh, here. And this could be, in practice, you do that with atoms that decay into two back-to-back -back photons. And then whether it's Alice or Bob can be measured on the, on the, on the polarization of the atom. When it's polarization this way, it's Alice, and when it's polarization that way, it's Bob. So, I mean, this can, this can be done, but I do this because I want to communicate something here. Now, there's no aunt. The atom makes a, a superposition of two possible states, and that's a, a, that's a hole, that's a quantum uh, hole. It's called an ent entanglement here. Now, of course, the photon we call Bob is going to the right, and a photon called Alice is going to the left. You don't measure them. But at the moment when this physicist here now, he may also be a dad, when he, when he observes, he receives the photon, he can measure its spin, its, it's uh, sorry, its, um, its um, polarization. And he says, I know it's Bob. Then at the same time, he can predict that mom must get Alice. Because the measurement sort of collapses this wave function into one or the other of these two possibilities. So he instantly knows, even if, if, if mom hasn't seen it yet, he can tell her that, that the, but that'll take time. So if they arrive simultaneously there and there, you, they will still be correlated like, like, um, like in the classical experiment. But you don't know when the, co when the correlation was broken. It's first broken when you actually look at the thing here. So all the way in the aeroplanes, and that's not aeroplanes, it's, it's photons going each their way, you do not know, you cannot say. If you measure it, then it's just like measuring where the electron went through the double slit experiment. You've done it. There's no, there's no, the interference is gone, and there's nothing there. So this kind of thing, you don't know until you actually watch it happen, <coughs> what it is. And it looks like a spooky communication out that says, well, I saw Bob, therefore this has to be Alice out there. Einstein called it spooky, uh, a spooky um, uh, faster than light movement. And he didn't, he invented relativity. He didn't like faster than light. So, um, so the question is now, and I'm almost at the end now, I'll, I'll quickly end it here. Um, one could ask whether there's an aunt. And Einstein, uh, uh, Podolsky and Rosen in 1936 made an argument which essentially came to there has to be more than quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics cannot be complete. Bohr answered it and said the conditions of an experiment depend that tells you what you can measure in the future. So if the condition is that, that you measure um, the photon polarization here, then you can predict, that's true, this here. But for example, for particles, they use particles where you have to know, he said, you can know both momentum and, and position because two photons have the same momentum in different directions. When you measure the momentum here, you know the momentum of this one. And you can also measure the position of this one here. So now you don't know both momentum and position, but that's impossible. Therefore, quantum mechanics is incomplete. That was his real argument, the EPR argument. But Bohr rejected it, but nobody understood him. And, and the most people sort of leaned towards Einstein. There was something wrong with quantum mechanics. Then came John Bell. There could be an aunt. There could be an aunt who had the information, like in a classical case. Then came John Bell. He said, could there be hidden variable, the aunts? Could there be such things? So quantum mechanics is just apparent statistics. Like all the statistics we deal with, for example, in elections, is apparent statistics. We could count every single person in Denmark and ask them what they, what they voted for, and there will be no statistics. There will just be numbers. But now we have probabilities instead because we make a sample. Um, could there be a local description with hidden variables underneath quantum mechanics? There, I say, are there cogwheels there? Is there mechani mechanical, something mechanical there, which we can know if we're smart enough? And then he made a calculation where he assumed, OK, let me assume that there is something like that, something a hidden variable. <coughs> let me assume there is that. And then he concluded that something had to be smaller than something else. There was an inequality he could make. And he immediately could point out that quantum mechanics violated the inequality, did not fulfill it. And then, about 20 years later, uh, 
an experiment was done by Alan Aspect, who clearly demonstrated that nature did not either uh, uh, agree with the inequalities but violated it too, like quantum mechanics predicts. I actually, Bell was in Copenhagen in 1964. I remember him, I heard his talk, but I don't remember what the talk was about. It may very well have been this. Okay, so this means that there is no simple explanation when two particles, quantum particles, hit each other and scatter off each other. You cannot get an a, um, a accident report which tells you precisely what happened, like everybody does with big car accidents or aeroplane accidents. You get a report on what really happened. You can't get it. So the quantum probabilities are primary and they cannot be reduced to missing detailed knowledge, knowledge about the system. That is very weird. So the, we cannot flee into Einstein's uh, explanation. So what are we faced with? We are faced with that our everyday life is somewhat deterministic, especially the computers we buy, we throw them away when they give up being deterministic. <laughs> they don't work. They absolutely, they do the same thing. If you run the same data, you come out with the same output. This is, this is the essence of a computer. You don't want it to come out with random output. <laughs> but underneath this determinism at the macroscopic level, there is this very, very weird quantum indeterminism and the, especially the superposition principle, that you can superpose wave, probability waves with each other, and they do say something about what happens in experiments, and therefore something about real physics. They are not physical, they are mathematical, but nevertheless, you can use them to predict what comes out of experiments. <coughs> and we have no inborn understanding of such things. So quantum mechanics, uh, we, we have to live without a real born. We have, when I talk about a, a, a gun and a bullet, we all have experiments of throwing a ball. It's the same thing. So uh, we have inborn intuition for how bullets will fly. A bit faster that we, uh, than we can think, but, but it, it's nevertheless, we do have some intuition. And so apart from the fact that we cannot, we have no deep intuitive understa understanding of it, Physicists nevertheless perform experiments, calculate theory, and for 100 years it has been working. It's, and and in, in industrial engineers are producing quantum devices. All your mobile phones would not work if it were not for quantum mechanics. So we are really in a strange situation. So young people don't care about all these worries about measurability and so on, and they just use quantum mechanics, calculate the results of of, of experiments and compare with the experiments. And it agrees. So this is where we are. We have 100 years of, of experiments and theory and quantum mechanics has stood unchanged except for the development of quantum field theory which is a little bit where you put relativity together with quantum mechanics and, um, and you, 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 you get a slightly more incompatible theory. But basically it's the same underlying Schrodinger equation that is at play there. So let me now finish by showing you this picture, which many of you probably have seen. It came the 21st of March this year from the Planck satellite. So we started quantum, the quantum uh, theory with Planck saying there are light comes in package, packages. Uh, and this is a picture of the universe about 380,000 years after Big Bang. And what you see here are temperature differences. Here is hot. Here it's cold, here's a cold spot, and so on. Normally you don't see this picture because they pull out this, this is called a dipole. There's a dipole, there's a direction. Our galaxy is moving in a, uh, together with its neighbors, are moving in one direction towards something we don't know what is. But they can take it out, and underneath you can see all these little fluctuations. <coughs> now these fluctuations, by the latest theory, it's not been, it is, becoming experimentally, uh, by such these pictures here, is becoming experimentally verified. These small fluctuations, the, ba the background temperature of the universe is three degrees above absolute zero. But then there are little corrections here. And the corrections that you see here and that are interesting from a quantum point of view is the hundred thousandths of a degree. And Planck has just measured for the whole sky, this is a whole sky you see put into an ellipsoid, um, an ellipse. Uh, there is a whole sky, and, 
and you see all the 100,000 degree differences here, hot, cold, hot and cold. And that can, by what's called inflation theory, be traced back to the time before, just after Big Bang, fractions of seconds after Big Bang, before matter had taken the state it is. There was an, a violent expansion of the universe. From very little, it was like a football. And it expanded into this enormous size that we have now for the universe. But the quantum fluctuations, quantum, in quantum field theory, there are little fluctuations of, of all the quantities. The vacuum is not just vacuum in quantum field theory. But there are little fluctuations, and these fluctuations were enlarged and became hot and cold, gave this hot and cold pattern. And it agrees fairly well, but it's, uh, the analysis is not finished yet. And without these hot and cold patterns, there would be no condensation kernels for, for galaxies and stars. So we have to look back there and see the reason that we see a universe full of galaxies and stars is that this was not uniform. It has little fluctuations which can use, be used as kernels for, like, like when you make raindrops, you have to have a little kernel, a little dust grain that the water molecules assemble on. In the same way here, matter is converging uh, on, on, uh, on, on galaxies and making galaxies. Galaxies are much smaller than these, these spots, by the way. Uh, so so, so they, they, these are groups of galaxies more. Now, what do we know about, the, and I'll start now just giving you three numbers, or four numbers. The universe is 13.8 um, two, I should have, I, I don't know why I wrote seven here, eight two giga years, million years old. It's become precise now. 4.9% of what you see of, ma of matter and energy in the universe is the, 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 the stuff we are made from, called light stuff, stuff that interacts with light, stuff that light can can hit, so to speak. Then there's, we know that from the motion of, of stars and galaxies and the motion of galaxies with each other, we know there must be some unseen matter, dark matter it's called, and that's 27%. It's five times more than real light. And then we know there's still, there's missing 68%, which is called dark energy, which you have actually a reasonably good you, it's it measured a little indirectly, but it, it's measured from the rapid increasing expansion of the universe. But this is how the universe is put together. So here at the time when I'm finishing my career as a physicist and just giving speeches or something like that, uh, there's more excitement ahead than there was when I started in 58, where we didn't know anything about the nucleus, really, not very much about it at least. We didn't know about the forces that kept the nucleus together, the atomic nucleus. Now we know all that, but other problems have appeared. It seems as if each time you solve a problem, new problems arrive, and physicists are happy when they have problems. Actors, and I have that from a Danish uh, actor, uh, theatre director, he said, when actors, he has worked both with actors and physicists, when actors meet a problem, they get, go home and are unhappy. When physicists meet a problem, they go home and are very happy. There's something to get, put your teeth in. Well, thanks for listening to me. <laughs> thanks a lot, uh, Benny, for the inspiring talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions, so, okay, there's one there, it's coming. Yeah. Hello, can Hello. you hear me? Thank you. Pardon? Thank you. Good talk. Yeah, well, um, thanks for listening. I have, I have a question.